Let's keep those hands raised right now in this moment. And I believe tonight can be a night of victory for you if you believe it. I think sometimes we pray for those moments where God is, you're waiting for God to do something, you're waiting for that moment in time. You're saying, God, when is it gonna happen? When are you gonna come through? When am I gonna get freedom from this cycle that I've been in? And I believe if you have faith, if you came here tonight believing that it is your turn, not just the person's turn next to you, that it is your turn tonight, that you're gonna get freedom here. Who believes it's your turn tonight? Don't get me wrong. I love when other people get blessed, but I love it just a little bit more when I do too. Come on. So I want you to say this, say, God, it's my turn tonight. I'm going to receive tonight. This word is for me. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You can go ahead and be seated. Thank you so much, worship team. Um, I am very excited and blessed to be speaking here tonight. If you don't know me, my name is Brian. I'm the youth pastor here for the Way World Outreach, come on. And um, man, I'll, I wanna give a shout out online, so if you wanna wave, it's a very special moment. Our Arrowhead campus is actually live streaming this service right here, so let's go ahead and wave to our Arrowhead campus. We see you, we see you Arrowhead. And let's say hi to our Arizona campus. They have youth service here tonight. And you know who else we have tonight is our Kenya campus. They're actually waking up in the morning right now, but they're live streaming. Let's go to say hi to Kenya. And man, I'm so blessed to be here. And I want to give you something that you have an opportunity to send a teenager to. It is our youth camp. Let's give it up for our youth camp. So right behind me, I want to let you know, we haven't been to camp in five years, but this year we're going back. We're going back to the mountain. We're taking our teenagers ages 12 to 18 back to the mountain to receive an impartation from God. And if you'd like, there are only 61 spots left. So if you got a teenager that are like, I don't know what we're gonna do, send them to camp, we'll take care of them. All right. You, you, you're this close to putting them in scared straight. Anybody remember that show? We're gonna scare them straight spiritually. So let's go ahead, it's July 16th through 19th. Go ahead and register a teenager. There are only 61 spots left and they're gonna go, it's in two months, and we wanna see your teenager there to get radically transformed for Jesus Christ. Who believes in this next generation? Come on, we gotta believe in them, and we gotta invest in them. And lastly, I just wanna give honor where honor is due. Um, pastor Marco Garcia and Lisa Garcia, let's give it up for the best pastors in the world. And also, Pastor Christian and Pastor Yesenia, who I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them, and I just want to show you a little bit of a blessing that I have. I want to show a photo of my family right behind me. That's my beautiful wife right there. I definitely prayed for that and God answered. Can I get an amen right there? And, um, and then my three kids are actually sitting right here. And um, I am a blessed man, but it wouldn't have come without prayer, without this church, without just staying rooted here. This year I celebrate 11 years of being at this campus, and I'm so blessed. You know, I didn't come here growing up in the church. My parents weren't pastors. Um, I didn't open the Bible until I was 23 years old. I had no Bible knowledge. I actually was an atheist. I hated God. If you tried to talk to me about God, I would want to make sure that you left feeling dumb for believing in a magical guy in the sky who grants your wishes. So if you brought someone here today who might be an atheist, I hope they can kind of receive. If you don't believe in God, if you're halfway in, if you just don't know, I get you. I understand you. I was there as well. But I'll hope that this story here tonight resonates with you and shows you that there really is a God and he really does love you and he really has a plan and purpose for your life. And I know that you're going to find that out today. Who believes that some people are going to give their life to Jesus tonight? All right, all right, all right. So... I'm going to go and dive right in. So for those of you who take notes, take out your notepad, take out your iPhone 20s and your Galaxy 40s. We're about to take some notes here tonight. 
The title of my message is this, Pray Like Jesus. What is it? Pray like Jesus. Now let's go ahead and jump into the passage from the Bible. We're actually going to be reading from our growth book. Who's going strong in your growth book? 365 growth book. All right, if you missed a day, just go back and get it. It's okay. All right. Now for some context, right before this, Jesus is at the Last Supper with his disciples where he shares that one of his disciples will betray him and his other disciples will desert him. Following this interaction and realization of his coming crucifixion and denial, Jesus runs to prayer. Let's go and read this passage in the book of Matthew, chapter 26, verse 36 through 46. It says, Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. This is Jesus talking. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went out a little farther and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. He said to Peter, couldn't you watch with me even for one hour? Keep watch and pray. What did he say? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, go and touch your skin, grab your skin, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them for a second time and prayed, my father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open. Who's ever been praying at like 11 o'clock at night? Or who's ever been watching three hours of like Disney Plus or three hours of Prime, and you're awake, you don't, you're not tired whatsoever, and as soon as you get convicted and say, I've been watching this for three hours, I should read my Bible, and you open up the Bible app, and like two and a half minutes later, you're like, Yeah. We've all been there. We've all been there, right? So here we go. So he went to pray a third time, saying the same things again. Then he came to the disciples and said, go in and sleep. Have your rest. But look, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up! Let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. Now here are three things we can learn about the way Jesus prayed in these moments. But before that, I want to share a personal highlight and story in January of this year, I actually hit two years of being a youth pastor. Now, why is that so huge? Because statistically, most youth pastors don't make it past two years. Isn't that crazy? The thing that allowed me to not be a statistic was prayer. Prayer removed all of the lies that I was believing. The frustration, the offense, Prayer positioned me for purpose, and prayer caused me not to quit. So point number one, you ready? Private prayers equal public victories. You know, it's one thing that I find interesting is that this, one of the only things that the disciples ever asked Jesus to teach them was to teach them how to pray. The disciples weren't asking Jesus to teach them necessarily how to heal the sick or even how to preach or how to fast or how to give or how to serve. I mean, let's be honest, if I was there, I'd be like, Jesus, teach me how to preach. Do I like go like this when I'm casting out the demon? Do I like say, in the name, and I look around to make sure who's watching? You know, when I heal the sick, do I like push them over, make sure they're, they're healed? Jesus, I want to know. I mean, I don't know how much longer I have with you, right? If I was with Jesus, I'd probably be asking him very vain things, but the disciples weren't asking him about any of that. You know, they saw the patterns of Jesus, the lifestyle of Jesus. Scripture says in Mark 135, now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. We can conclude that Jesus prayed roughly four hours before sunrise. 
I can feel the conviction in the room just there. The disciples recognized what the source was. Here we go. Prayer is the source. Say it again with me. Prayer is the source. I don't think you believe it. Say it to the person next to you. Prayer is the source. Now I think you believe it. You know what's crazy? Prayer reveals secrets that you need in your public life. But they can only be found in your private prayer life. God, I need a secret. What do I do with that business? What do I do with this venture? What house do I buy? I want to sound wise. I want to get a job. I want the secrets of heaven that you need to find those secrets in your private prayer life. Jesus prompted the disciples to pray because he knew of the spiritual battle ahead. Peter goes on after this to reject Christ. He lost his next battle due to him not being ready perfectly for it. Jesus knew his next battle needed next battle prayer. Here we go. Before Jesus defeated death on that cross, Jesus defeated the cross in his prayer life. Before David defeated Goliath, he learned to defeat lions and bears. He defeated Goliath in prayer. Before Daniel had the mouth of lions shut, he defeated them in prayer. Before Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, he got the plan in? You got it right. You got it right. Here's this. You want to defeat some family generational curses that have torn your family apart? You got to first defeat them in prayer. You want to overcome that temptation and that lust and that crazy mindset? You got to first defeat them in? I think you got it. Jesus prayed in private so he could cast out demons in public. You know, it's taken you weeks to get through this battle when it should have just taken you an hour. You've been still going through that issue and dealing with that issue. You're still complaining about it, talking about it. It's been 10 years, and you still haven't overcome it. We look like modern-day Israelites. Should have been, it should have taken us a week. I'm not saying it should have taken you time, but it shouldn't have taken you that long to get over it. It's probably because we haven't gone through it in prayer. You've been in the wilderness long than you need to be. It's time to come out of that pity party. It's time to get yourself out of that pity party. Pray yourself out of that pity party. It's time to come out of that tomb. It's time to let God heal you to use you. You know, many of us can be asleep spiritually. I don't think Jesus was necessarily telling the disciples, wake up physically. I think he was also telling them to wake up spiritually. The Spirit of God inside of us, like Scripture says it's willing to serve. It's willing to, oh my gosh, I'm going to cuss Pastor Chris. I'm going to say the S word. It's willing to submit. God. Y'all better not make me a meme tomorrow. Mike, he just said the S word. Submission. The Spirit of God is willing to let go of that relationship with the flesh that we feed every day by not crucifying it, by listening to that music, by watching those shows, it's weak. The flesh that we feed is causing us to disobey God. Right here it says this, then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. He said to Peter, couldn't you watch with me for even one hour? Keep watching and pray so that you will not give into temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. I'm not going to lie. When I first came to church and I got in a prayer meeting, I could have been in and out in a minute. I'm I'm just praying, God, I thank you so much, and I'm good. And they're still praying. And I'm like, man, am I supposed to, like, like this? You know, like, am I, I don't, I don't feel like praying. Like, I've prayed, I've I've been five minutes. What else am I going to pray about? So if you don't know how to pray for an hour, I don't blame you. If you're getting through it, I don't blame you. You know what's cool? Pastor Marco has a video on YouTube called How to Pray for an Hour. Go ahead and look that up. But I don't want you to beat yourself up if you're not a natural praying person, if you're not naturally a person who seeks the presence of God. That's not me either. You know what? has caused me to be a praying person is not necessarily the desire to be a praying person is being someone who's understood that prayer positions me for purpose 
That prayer is the thing that I need. Maybe not the thing that I want, but it's the thing that I need. So I put certain things in my life where I put non-negotiables. Told my wife years ago, I said, baby, I don't care what happens at the Wayworld Outreach, we're not leaving. If we get offended, we're not leaving. If we get frustrated, we're not leaving. If we feel like quitting, if we feel tired, we are not leaving. We have pre-decided that this is our church, that this is where we're going to stay, unless God himself, and even through leadership, says, yes, you are called to leave. We're not going anywhere. I made that pre-decision because I didn't allow the emotion to dictate my decision. I decided prior. Hey, baby, five years from now, when we get offended, when? Trust me, it's going to happen. When we get offended five years from now, let's decide right now that we're not leaving. When you wake up tomorrow morning and you don't want to do anything other than just watch TV, then just to listen, then go to on Instagram. You have pre-decided right now, 7 o'clock in the morning, I don't care how I feel, I'm praying. I'm not going to run by emotions. I'm not going to run by how I feel. I have pre-decided because I'm not going to let my emotions in the moment to tell me what to do. Some of y'all need just some pre-decisions instead of in the moment decisions. They were with Jesus and they still fall asleep. You can be in the church and asleep. You can be a Christian and asleep. You can still be serving and asleep. You know, don't sleep, don't sleep on your assignment. If Peter have been woken up physically and spiritually and drew close in dependence on God, he could have kept from denying Jesus at that critical hour. You know what's a very popular saying that's just been grinding my gears lately? Is this. Well, everything happens for a reason, brother. That's right, every, uh, you know, everything happens for a reason. I know I cheated on my wife, but you know, everything happens for a reason. You know what that does? This saying removes self-accountability. And it makes God responsible for our heinous things that have happened. That's not God's fault. It's the enemy's fault. It's sin's fault. Well, why are you bringing that up, Bryant? Well, because I hear this a lot. Oh, it's just, you know, I left, I, I got fired from that job. You know, everything happens for a reason. And I'm like, yeah, you literally stole from the company. That, that, that was a reason. Well, you know, um, I was in that ministry and, uh, you know, they didn't tell me I could serve, but everything happens for a reason. Yeah, because you were literally doing crazy things online and posting crazy stuff. You were, you were Mr. Sneaky Sneaky. But everything happens for a reason, brother. It really does. It could be us. It could be our lack of prayer life. The reason could be you just didn't pray. I think in a culture of pushing off responsibility and accountability and blaming on somebody else, let's just say right now, some things may be your fault because you didn't pray. Let's just be honest. Some of the reasons why I got myself in trouble is because I just didn't pray. Just be honest with yourself, Brian. I, you just didn't pray. That's right. It's somebody else's fault. It's somebody else's fault. It's my fault. I didn't pray. That's why some marriages are being destroyed publicly because you don't pray with your spouse privately. You lost your job publicly because you didn't pray for your job privately. You're not being used publicly because God doesn't, does, doesn't see or God sees your lack of prayer life privately. Mark 9, 28 through 29 says this. Afterward, when Jesus was alone in the house with his disciples, they asked him, why couldn't we cast out that evil spirit? Jesus replied, this kind be, can be cast out only by prayer. And yes, some say by prayer and fasting. This demon only comes out by prayer. I'm not going to lie. When I first came into ministry and started serving on the altar team, and I wasn't praying, I was like, Lord, please don't let anybody start manifesting in front of me. I haven't been praying. I haven't been praying. I don't want to be called out. I don't want to be called out. My worst fear was like if a demon started manifesting right here, they'd turn to me and be like... Brian? I know you. <laughs> I'm in you. What? what, what? Shut up, demon. You know? <laughs> it's because I was so embarrassed. I knew I wasn't praying. I knew I wasn't in the word. I knew I wasn't being holy. 
God, do not let anybody manifest in front of me. You know, this demon only comes out by prayer, not by shouting, not by worrying, not by gossiping, not by complaining, not by posting about it, but by prayer, says Jesus. Man, I've complained long enough about this, these issues. I've been bitter enough. I've been offended enough. Let me pray these things away. You might be sitting there like I was 11 years ago saying, how do I pray? One scripture in the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 9 through 13, that says this. Pray like this, not just pray this. It says pray like this. Our, head, our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we eat and forgive us of our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. You might be saying, I can't remember that. Well, if you ever smoked weed, you would known as that's the gateway drug. Anybody ever heard of that? Gateway drug? Let me give you the gateway prayer. This is a gateway prayer that introduces you to bigger prayers. You ready? God, I need you. I don't know what to do. That's the gateway prayer. Somebody repeat after me. God, I need you. I don't know what to do. <laughs> that's the gateway prayer. It opens up a bunch of other prayers. You even, you ain't even got to speak English. You can speak ghetto and God can still hear you. You just got to speak to God. All right, y'all, y'all crazy. Let's go in and get to point number two. You ready? Point number two is this. Not my will, but God's will. What is it? Not my will. Let me share a little bit of a testimony. You know, when I first did come to this church, I was an atheist. Uh, I started. I didn't believe in God. I, I looked at the Bible and I said, this thing is a magical book. Why would I believe in this? But I came and I just started wrestling and I realized my life wasn't taking me anywhere. Culture wasn't taking me anywhere. I thought myself as my own God. And I couldn't lead myself anywhere. I said, all right, God, I'll, I'll. I literally said these words. I'll trust your magical book one verse at a time. I was one of those crazy, like, mean atheists, you know what I'm talking about? That was me. I started applying one scripture at a time, and it just kept working. Over time, I stopped relying on my own wisdom and thoughts and started relying on the word of God. Then I started praying and trying to hear the voice of God. I didn't know it was, if it was God's voice, my voice, the devil's voice. I just ate some bad tacos last night. I don't know. What is it? What am I, I, is this your voice, God? Has anybody ever had that? I don't know if this is God's voice or my voice or the devil's voice. But hearing something from God, I compared it to scripture. Listening in service and making sure that I'm translating the Bible correctly and God's voice correctly. And also wise counsel. When people come up to me and they've made decisions already and they say, God told me this, this. You know what that does to me? Okay. Ties my hands. And most of the case, what ends up happening is they don't want to hear what you have to say, so they use the God told me part. And they go and do their thing, and then they come back, and I don't say I told you so. I say, okay, let's go ahead and fix it. You know what I do is I always say this. Hey, I think this is what God's telling me. What do you think, Pastor Marco? What do you think, Pastor Gabe? One time I came up to Pastor Marco and I said, I, this is just what I'm feeling. I know it's not from God. What do you think? He was like, yeah, that's demonic. I said, yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, imagine being corrected by Pastor Marco. That's like, you're, you're right. That was demonic. It was on the phone. I was like, that was demonic. I can't believe I thought that. Yeah, it was demonic. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Man. So why do we pray? to understand God's way. Let's all say it together. Why do we pray? To understand God's way. Let me talk to the millennials and the Gen Z. I'm a millennial. Here's a quote from Francis Chan. He said this, one of the most destructive practices of our generation is that we value our own thoughts way too much. You've, you're, you value your thoughts and your emotions way too much. When the word says in Isaiah 55, it says, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. 
for just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. When people ask, Brian, what are your thoughts on this without the Bible? Who cares what my thoughts are? My thoughts will lead you to hell. Your thoughts led you to prison, to the drugs, to the offense. I need God's thoughts in my life. You don't want to know what I have to say tonight. Who cares what I have to say? I led myself to destruction. I want God's wisdom, his word, his direction in my life. It's a system. Pray, ask God, follow God. Even in our jobs, there's a system, a certain way to do things. In sales, you have a sales process. They say follow the process and you'll be successful. Sure, you can veer off and find some success on your own. You can do it on your own, of course, but you'll always end up needing to compromise in order to stay successful. Or you'll, be, you'll end up getting fired or breaking something. God has a plan for life. It's called the Bible, the Word of God. And you know what's crazy? This is His world. We're just living in it. The smartest and wisest I became is when I prayed a prayer like Solomon. God, I'm like a child among these people. I don't know what to do. I need your wisdom. I just stopped relying on my own thoughts, on my own wisdom. Even this, even this sermon, I, I ran it through Pastor Christian and, and Pastor Mike, and they were running through it. And I, yeah, that don't make sense. Yeah, and I was like, oh, thank you, Lord. I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm grateful that I had pastors and leaders in the church to correct me when I'm wrong. I'm afraid if you don't know how to get corrected. And a lot of times we don't want to get corrected. I remember years ago, Pastor Gabriel was a youth pastor. And I said, hey, that'd be amazing if I could sit in the 7 a.m. leaders meeting on Sundays with Pastor Marco. Just be a fly on the wall. You know what he said? No, I can't have that. Oh, okay. Um, why not? You know what he said? Because you make inappropriate jokes at the wrong time. What? <laughs> yeah, last week, remember when that guy was in my office and it was a very serious moment? You just made a joke. And I realized, that I, I'm like... That's, that's what my family does. That's what I do. That's what I've done all my life. And I started realizing that a lot of my personality and the things that I said were the through heels and all of this were ruining my opportunities. And when he corrected me, it hurt. <laughs> but correction is just you at a line and you being put in perfect position, ready for God to use you. Some of y'all got to ask your leader, hey, if you see something, correct me. And they're going to be like, are you sure? Because the last time I tried to say something, you kind of like, correct me, I need to be corrected. Who needs to be corrected sometimes? Humble yourself, be corrected, it's good for you. It hurts, but it's good for you. Matthew 26, 42 says this, then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, my father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. How many times do we have to ask God if there can be another way? God, can I get another wife? Can I get another job? Can I get another car? Can I get another home? Jesus says no to us as well because we haven't stewarded the one we have. I'm not saying steward the wife you have, in, uh, but stay with that one. I'm talking about cars, okay? Don't misinterpret what I'm saying. All right, I'm talking about cars and homes. Jesus did not let his feelings lead him. His feelings were real, but his obedience to God was greater. His feelings were momentary. You know, how do we know God's voice is, we know God's word. If we try to interpret God's voice without God's word, we will be deceived. You need the church. You need wise counsel. That's how people think of crazy things and believe it. The thing about deception is you don't know you're being deceived. 
A lot of other people can see, yeah, he's deceived, but you don't think so. You know what the world gives? This advice, follow your heart. Horrible advice. Jeremiah 17, 9 says this, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things, desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Don't trust your heart. You're wicked. I'm wicked without God. Just get, get, just get over it. You're wicked without God. God, I'm wicked without you. Like, I am crazy without God. Like, I'm crazy without God. You would not want me anywhere around your family without the Lord. Like, I'm being totally honest. Do not, if I, don't, if I ever have a day where I don't serve God, which I pray that never happens, do not invite me over. I'm crazy without God. The world says this, follow your own truth. John 14, 6 says this, Jesus says, I am the truth, the way, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. My truth doesn't matter. Your truth doesn't matter. Their truth doesn't matter. Only the truth matters, and that's Jesus. Only God's truth matters. So let's reiterate. Some of our prayers are not answered because they just simply go against God's plan for our lives. All right, point number three. You ready? Say, I'm ready. ready. Prayer gives you power and faith. Here's a quote from Miles Monroe. He says this, the greatest tragedy in life is not death, but life without a purpose. Prayer allows me to understand my purpose. You know, if you wear glasses like I do, you'll have to go to an optometrist and they'll check your eyesight and they'll let you know if you have an astigmatism or what's wrong with your eyes. And I remember for years, the, the, the lights would just hurt me and I wouldn't be able, I don't know why. And I finally said, maybe I need some glasses. And I went and I went with my wife and I tried it on and I looked at her. I said, oh, thank God. All right. Anybody? No? No? Okay. All right. Anyways, let's keep moving. All right. Um, there's a better vision than 2020. It's called 2015. And I want to show you a little bit of an illustration right over here. You know, prayer aligns our perspective with God's perspective. You can't trust your perspective. You know, although I have these glasses right here, I, I mean, I could have a perspective from anybody, from the world. These are kids' glasses. The way I view life is through the perspective <laughs> of me as a six-year-old. Unhealed, still with wounds, still broken, I'm not saying what happened to you was fair. I'm not saying what happened to you was okay and wasn't God's plan for your life. What happened to you was horrible. The way that man touched you, the way your parents rejected you. I'm not saying any of that was God's plan for you, but I am saying this. As adults, it's our responsibility to get healed. Or otherwise, you know how you're going to view church and life and your marriage and now your future family through the eyes of a little broken six-year-old. Or how about this? Maybe you still got that playboy life, right? Maybe that party girl scene. You view church and life and people through this perspective. You have those little responses, you know, why the lights got to be that much? Why they got lights? What is it, a concert? Right? I wonder how much the pastor gets paid. I wonder this. You know, we, we see life through this lens of frustration and of I'm my own God and what can I get out of God? What can I get out of the church? Because you're used to getting everything from a girl or a guy. You're used to getting everything pleasure, so you look at life with what can I get? Or maybe my wife's glasses. You look at God through her prayer life. You don't have a prayer life. You allow your, God, your wife to have the prayer life for your family. So whatever, oh, yeah, baby, did you pray about it? You know, in the Bible, 
mostly shows the men praying and seeking the Lord. And I think that's a tactic of the enemy in this culture is where we remove that leadership role. I'm not saying a, a, a prayer of a woman or a mom is invalid. I'm literally here because of a praying mom. But I'm saying this, how much more effective could it be with a wife and a husband who prayed together for a man to say this, maybe my father didn't lead me, but I'm going to lead my family. Maybe I didn't have anybody to teach me how to pray, but I'm going to break some generational curses. Maybe I didn't have my father to show me the ways of the Lord, but I'm going to be a man of God who submits to leadership, who says yes to the Lord. I'm going to teach my children what it is to be a man of God. Wednesdays and Sundays, we are in the church. And even if you do get this, even if you do get God's perspective, there's still only an amount that you can see in front of you. God can see in the future and you can't. God can see tomorrow and you can't. God can see five years from now and I can't. So Jesus in Matthew 26, 44 through 46, he went to pray a third time. Saying the same things again. Then he came to the disciples and said, go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. And here's where he switches up. But look, the time's come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Up! Let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. Jesus, third time praying, he came back ready. He had that Jesus swag. He said, mira, there comes that fool. <laughs> he don't even know. He don't even know what he's going to do. That's a San Bernardino translation right there. <laughs> right? Prayer aligns our heart to his which then aligns our will to his. Prayer positions us for purpose. Jesus' prayer was in reference to his coming suffering on the cross. When you pray, you're ready to attack the day. When you pray, you get supernatural strength for the battle ahead. When you pray, you've got this edge on the situation, a calmness to the battle, a victory mindset. When you pray, you're not anxious, but filled with authority. When you pray, you're filled with strength. When you pray, you're filled with the confidence of the Lord. I call that confidence. Man, there's some times where I'm filled with anxiety, frustration, all these things, and I know I need to go in prayer and lay hands on myself, and I need to get ready for the night. I need to get ready for tonight. I need to lay hands on myself and pray for peace, for authority. Thank you, Lord. I need to repent for anything. But when you pray and you pray and you pray, you walk out with this authority and confidence that you didn't have before. I'd like you all to stand up in this moment. Hebrews 12.2 says this. Jesus, he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Prayed. God, allow this cup of suffering to pass. But your will be done. Hebrews says this. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross. And what that says is that the cross was here, but the joy of us knowing God was here. So yes, Jesus saw the coming pain and the coming torture and him on the cross and the disciples rejecting him and being spat on. But he looked through the cross and saw you and I. He looked through the cross and said, there's a joy set before me. There's a reason why I'm going to the cross. There's a reason why I'm doing this. You are that reason. If you're anywhere in life, I don't know your story. I don't know what's happened to you. Unfortunately, some things have happened to us that's just not our fault. But here's the thing, we're here tonight. And like a doctor, I know the condition of a man and a woman's heart without the Lord. It's crushed, it's 
be destroyed, filled with anxiety, depression, suicide. And all I'm going to invite you today is not to a religion that tells you to do certain things and you'll get God's love. But I'm inviting you to a relationship. The reason that Jesus went to the cross was to die as a ransom for many, for you and I. To go in place of us, he who knew no sin became sin for you and I. And if you have something tingling inside of you today, I don't believe that's goosebumps. I believe that may be the Holy Spirit calling out to you, saying, son, daughter, today is the day to say yes to me. Today is the day to come back to me. You haven't fully committed. You haven't fully said yes. You want to know all the details planned out in front of you. But God's saying, just trust me first and I'll lead you. You've trusted everything else. You've trusted everybody else. And where has it led you? Where did it lead me? So today, I'm going to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. He can wipe away your sin, wipe away your rap sheet, make you clean in the eyes of God and give you a fresh, new start. He even says this, that what the enemy meant for evil, God can turn it around for good. You got touched by, as a little girl, you got raped, you got rejected, you got abandoned. That was not God's plan, but he's gonna make it work out for your favor. He's gonna turn it around for good. How can God turn that around for good? He can use you as a person, a ministry leader, to help other young girls and other young boys get out of that place. So if you're gonna say yes to Jesus, you're gonna do it, and I want you to raise your hand publicly on the count of three. This is a public thing you gotta do. If that's you tonight, on the count of three, don't let anything stop you. You're gonna give your life to Jesus. Raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Raise your hands all over this place if you're gonna give your life to Jesus. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. Don't let anything stop you. I did it too. I did it too. I was at a service and I raised my hand. I raised my hand too. I didn't have all the answers. I didn't know what it looked like, but I raised my hand too. Those who raise their hand, I want you to do one thing. Turn around at your seat and look at your seat. That seat is your old life. That seat was the pain in the past, was the ex, was the broken relationship, was the divorce. And I want you to do one thing. I want you to leave that seat and come down to the altar because you got a new life ahead of you. You got a brand new start. God's doing something new in your life. Come on, let's give him a round of applause. Come on, come on, come on, bring him down. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. Come on, bring him down. We want to welcome you. Come to the altar. We want to pray with you. We want to love on you. We want to support you. We want to be here for you. We all did this too. We all came down to the altar too. Turn to the person next to you and say, do you have to be down there? I'll, I'll, I'll walk up there with you and bring them down. So proud of you. Now here's the next call. I'm gonna do a second call. It's for those of you who just been living a lukewarm life. And the condemnation is killing you. And I wanna challenge you today to start a new life and to say this, God's calling me to be on fire. My family deserves me to be on fire. My children deserve me to be on fire for God. I can't continue being lukewarm any longer. So if that's you, 
If God's calling you to an on fire, sold out life to Jesus, the only life there is. I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. God's calling you to on fire life. So proud of you. So proud of you. And if you need prayer, I want you to come up here to the altar as well. We want you to come up because we want to lay hands on you and pray for you and support you in this moment. Man, I'm so proud of each and every one of you. Remember, we all did this too. We were all down here at the altar. So was I almost 11 years ago, not knowing what lied ahead, but I just said yes. God, I've been my own, I've been my own God. I've led my own life. Today is the new beginning you've been waiting for. Do you believe it? So I want you to pray with me right now. And this prayer, you're gonna repeat after me. But I don't want you to put so much emphasis on the words that you're gonna say if your heart isn't there. It's like somebody saying, yeah, I love you too. You can say the words, but they know you didn't mean it. If you mess up on these words, don't worry about it. Do you really want to give your life to Jesus today? So go ahead and close your eyes. Don't care about anybody else. This is your day. This is your time. This is your moment. Say, Jesus, today, I repent for doing things my way. Forgive me, God. I turn away from my old life and I turn to you. I forgive all of those who hurt me. I seek no revenge. God, you're the judge. Heal me of my broken heart. Today, I believe and I declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. He died on the cross. He resurrected from the dead. He is the only truth, the only life, and the only way. Set me free. Today, I'm born again. I'm a believer, and I have a new life. If I died today, I'd go to heaven. Not because of what I did, but because of what you did, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Come on, let's give it up for Jesus. Let's give it up for Jesus. If you do need some extra prayer, we ask that you just come down to this altar. We want to pray with you. We want to talk to you. Otherwise, we love each and every one of you. We'll see you at church this Sunday, 9 a.m., 11 a.m., 1.30 p.m.